Good evening, everybody, and welcome to everyone either joining us here live in the room or virtually online. Uh, I'm Martin Possel. I'm the Senior Research Fellow here at the Paul Mellon Centre, and it's my great pleasure to introduce and host this evening's event. Now, this is the first uh, of this autumn's public events programme, and as some of you know, or maybe many of you know, the, the Mellon Centre's been committed for a number of years to a regular public lecture program. In that respect, nothing has changed. This autumn, however, we've decided to mix things up a little by offering a more varied menu, which involves not just lectures here at the centre, but hands-on visits to museums, galleries, print collections, and print workshops, interrogating a broad spectrum of themes and perspectives, historic, modern, and contemporary. As we've noted into the, in the introduction to the uh, series of events, and I quote, prints are multiple, yet individual, they're unpredictable, hard to regulate, often critical, funny, ephemeral, frightening, irreverent, angry, or just plain weird. They can be popular or obscure, sophisticated or clumsy, beautiful or ugly, and when not responding to market demand, repetitive and dull. This series will not be, however, repetitive or dull. It will be original and scintillating. In this respect, I'd like to thank my colleagues uh, Rachel Prosser and uh, Esme Bogus, the masterminds behind the series, as well as my other esteemed Mellon, fellow Mellons, uh, Surya Chatterjee, Martin Myrone, Anthony Tino, and Doug Paul Freeman. As always, these events are open to all, it's terribly important to us, and no prior art historical knowledge is necessary. So, and I do stress this, everyone's welcome to participate actively. So please feel free to, and confident to ask any questions that are important to you and any knowledge or personal experience that may promote discussion, reflection, and open up fresh perspectives. Now, this evening, we're fortunate to have with us two distinguished speakers. Ben Thomas is an art historian and curator based at the University of Kent, where he is a reader in art history. He's the author of Edgar Vint and Modern Art in Defense of Marginal Anarchy, Humphrey Ocean, and was curator of Drawing Together at the Courtauld Gallery and co-curator of the award-winning Raphael, The Drawings at the Ashmolean Museum. Ben has published widely on prints and is currently writing a book on this subject entitled Multiple Histories and, big plug, Ben's exhibition Poetry and Magic at the Italian Cultural Institute in London will run from the 7th to the 30th of November 2023 and contains prints, among other works, by Marcel Hanselaar. Marcel is a printmaker who, as she says herself, looks for ways to express those elusive questions of who and what we are when the mask is off and how we appear when the mask is on. The shock effect of her work lies in the contrast of combining her outspoken subject matter through the conventional medium of oil painting or etching her work is included in public collections including the British Museum, the V&A, the Ashmolean, the Fitzwilliam, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, as well as museums in Antwerp, Aberystwyth, uh, and The Hague. Just a, few, a word about the format of the evening so everybody's clear. Um, it's going to commence with a PowerPoint presentation given by Ben, and that'll last about 30 minutes. Then that'll be followed by, we'll segue seamlessly into a discussion uh, where Marcel's work will be the focus, and Ben and Marcel are going to talk together to one another with that. Uh, and then we're going to have about 30, up to 30 minutes, if we need it or want it, of panel discussion and questions from the floor. That's this floor and the virtual floor uh, beyond, okay? We'll have a roving mic in the room, and that's uh, going to be in Rachel's hands. Uh, Rachel's sitting at the back. And Esme's on the... That sounds like a musical instrument. Zoomy is on the Zoom chat box moderation. And last but not least, Doug, our very own rock legend, uh, is in charge of live stream and technical support. So once we've finished our deliberations, you're invited to join the drinks reception in the ante room. That's those of you who are in this room. For those of you outside, you'll have to go and get your own drink. Uh, and if you've got other plans, uh, you can also leave the center. So we'll all be done and dusted by eight o'clock. So, and on to this evening's main event. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Ben. Thank you, Ben. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, and to everyone at the Mellon Centre, and thank you all for coming this evening. Um, this is going to be a really exciting series of events, and the theme is Printmaking for Change. And you're going to discover, if you follow the, all the events, lots of ways in which printmaking has challenged us to rethink the world. And I thought what I'd do today, rather than try to exhaustively describe what states are, impressions, or different techniques, and so on, is just to give you some themes about, to think about, about why printmaking is intrinsically producing change. Not necessarily intentionally, but is, is a medium that, that does this. So I start here with um, a famous image by Abraham Boss, uh, a mid uh, 17th century French printmaker that shows the rolling press and also the communal process of, of uh, inking and wiping clean and then printing the press, uh, the, the prints from the intaglio copper plate. So this is the bit after an artist like Marcel has, has uh, finished etching the plate. And the word that I'm interested to hear is figure. Uh, so the title is, this figure shows you how to print intaglio plates. And so that sort of ties in with the debate in 17th century France about discourse, words, in other words, words that describe things, and figures or images, illustrations, that show you things. And that's the first thing that prints do, is that shows you very effectively information that otherwise would involve a long discussion. So I think you've all immediately grasped something of the technique of printing using a printing press just from looking quickly at this image. And this um, dialogue between figure and discourse, image and text, is something that goes on through the history of printmaking. I'm interested, for instance, in what happened when Giorgio Vasari published his great set of biographies in 1550. Um, suddenly, people all over Europe could read about Italian artists, but what he got was people writing to him, like the, the scholar Domenicus Lampsonius wrote to him from Antwerp saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. It all sounds fascinating. I've learned Italian in order to read your book, but please could you show us some of these images? I can't just get on my horse and ride to Florence and look at the, the paintings that you're talking about. So the exactly repeatable pictorial statement that's brought about by printmaking helped in lots of ways to convey information. So prints are encyc encyclopedic. John Evelyn talks about them as like a, a visual encyclopedia, a repertoire of images that, that can be exchanged around the world because they're very portable. So this is my theatrical moments, my notebook. Inside the pocket, I have a little print by Wenzel Holler. So this is a 17th century print made in London by a bohemian artist after a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, which is now in Windsor. And it shows what happens when people let their emotions become imbalanced, they start to develop slightly grotesque features. And so it's a warning to us from the late 15th century by an Italian artist about remaining human, conveyed by a bohemian artist all over Europe in this tiny form. Um, so it's a, it's a really radical technology. Which brings me to my next idea, which is translation. So if the first idea was figures, translation, I think, is my uh, other idea here. Slightly perversely, I'm showing you an original print by Claude Melan. So he came up with the image himself. So in what way is it tr a translation? It's translated from a drawing into a print form. And the detail shows you um, Melan as a very radical printmaker, because this is what the French call a single cut. So the engraver has only cut into the uh, copper plate once. There's no cross hatching. And it's all done by pressure to make the, the line deeper and wider. And that change in pressure conveys the 
changing tone and the changing relief of the, of the things that are represented. Here are the draperies of um, a group of saints. So it's a, it's a translation into a coded visual language of lines and cross hatchings. But it's also translation in the, um, I suppose, the sort of etymological sense of translation, which means to take from something from one side to another. So it, it allows us to take an image like the Leonardo and transport it somewhere else. So it's a translation into a different visual language, but it's also a form of dissemination. And dissemination is a type of analysis. So again, the original word of analysis means to let something loose from its moorings, like a ship. If you were to untie a ship, it would, it would um, be let loose. And by separating things out, we can compare them and analyze them. So one of the things prints allows us to do is to make comparisons. I think art history sort of begins with printmaking because on a tabletop you can start to compare different artists' work. You can, you can start putting them together in terms of schools. It's around the time that people started arranging their collections of prints into the Dutch school or the Italian school or the French school that we start to get some of the fundamental ideas of art history, which are really about how you organise your print collection. Um, other people would organise their print collections in terms of the books they had in their library. So you might collect portraits of all of the writers that you're interested in, or you might put um, images into your Bible. You might extra illustrate your Bible. So prints are a sort of time travel and also a form of armchair travel as well. You can start to learn about places you've never been to if you collect topographical prints or uh, images of archaeological digs or landscapes from places you've never been to. I'm showing you here a sequence of views produced by a 17th century Dutch amateur artist called Jan de Bishop who collected drawings from all over the place um, in order to create iconic images. He's created a canon of, of um, classical art. I like this quote from Bishop. He says, whatever I possess is of con constant use to everyone, and the more its usefulness redounds to other, others, the more it brings pleasure to me. So there's a sort of generosity about doing this. He's sharing visual information with a wider audience. But it's also a form of dislocation. So this is the Medici Venus, which is now in the Uffizi, which originally was a cult object. Um, Venus rising from her bath. Simultaneously, the universal image of love and beauty and a vulnerable woman getting out of the bath being seen in a way which makes her cover herself in this uh, pudica gesture. So what happens when you reproduce it from different angles against a, a sort of flattened, hatched background is that we are seeing a form of analysis. Um, I like to think of printmakers as the original analytical philosophers. They, they are doing philosophical work in dislocating this sequence of views from the original object. And it's being spread around across um, Europe and the world. So it's separating um, the image from its cult status, and even from its image as a treasured object in an aristocratic art collection. And it becomes a sequence of detached statements, statements about antiquity, about female beauty, about canonicity in art practice, about things that you could emulate or poses that you could use, gestures that you could appropriate. And all of these things, appropriation, emulation, and so on, are encouraged by the existence of prints, thousands and thousands of them. Um, the sudden abundance of images is something we take for granted in our, our digitally saturated world of images. 
but in the 17th century, this is quite something. Another thing that prints do that provoke change is to reverse things. Um, this is a technical uh, fundamental that when you put that copper plate through the rolling press, the image is reversed in the printing process. You can, if you're clever, anticipate that and do a drawing that's in reverse that then is reversed back again. But just for the sake of time, there seems to have been, and, and economies of scale, a huge acceptance of reversal of images in early modern Europe. We do see them occasionally in, in magazines. I mean, if you're a rock geek like me, you get annoyed at seeing left-handed guitarists when you know that they're right-handed in, in magazines where the photograph's been reversed. But reversal is, is absolutely pervasive in print culture. But it can also reverse meaning as well as the direction of and orientation of an image. So this is one of my favorite prints um, by one of the principal um, pioneers of a technique called mezzotint, which is a technique of printmaking that's very tonal and doesn't have any lines in it at all. You, you do it briefly by rocking the plate with a tool called the rocker. You go backwards and forwards over the plate until it's like a thick shag pile carpet. You ink that and it comes out very rich black. It's very boring for the apprentice that has to do it, hence off my rocker. Um, as, as the expression goes. Now this um, is a reproductive print and it reproduces and reverses this uh, painting by Guido Rani. So Guido, Guido's painting exists in two versions. This is the one in the Louvre that I'm showing you. And it shows drawing and color, uh, two aspects of paint, the art of painting. And in the painting, it's drawing who holds the position of honor, um, who has the right-handed gesture, and who is signaling the theoretical primacy of drawing over color. Vion uh, drew on a drawing by Yander Bishop, who copied Guido Reni in this lovely wash drawing, which is now in Turin, and then in copying that, reversed the image, but also reversed the meaning of the image. Because in the mezzotint, where there's no outlines at all, and it's purely tonal, it's now the female figure that has the place of honor. And it's color that takes precedence over line. And I'm interested in the fact that at about this time, French theorists like Roger de Peel are starting to say, actually, it's color that is what's distinctive about the visual arts. So reversals. That image was a very high art image with quite a theoretical content. But there's a, a dialogue constantly between high art and low life, to put it in Hogarthian terms, in the print medium. Are prints really art? Um, does it matter? I mean, they're wonderful, rich images. Uh, but they're also multiple, collectible, cheaper on the whole. I mean, found this in Portobello Market for 10 pounds a few years ago. It's a genuine original artwork, but multiple. Some of my philosopher friends say, how can a multiple be an original artwork? Um, surely it has to be unique, the only one of its kind. Well, tell that to the printmakers or indeed the sculptors, you know, the beautiful Rodin Burgers of Calais down by the Houses of Parliament is no less original for being one of seven or eight lifetime approved versions and there are even more posthumous ones. But Hogarth here is, is um, satirizing and, and playfully pointing to the distinction between high art and the life of the street where we have um, a musician, possibly a, uh, an Italian musician, unable to rehearse because of the raucous street noises that are coming from the London street. People sharpening their knives and uh, singing ballads. 
honking on horns, calling out their trades, and then the little boy peeing in the, in the bottom. Uh, what could be less artistic? Or he may be contrasting Dutch art here with, with Italian art. Take that satire even further and we get someone like uh, Cruikshank at the beginning of the 19th century. Here, um, a parody of the Statue of Achilles on Hyde Park Corner, uh, poking fun at the Duke of Wellington. And there's lots of overheard and possibly invented scabrous and, and um, funny comment. So prints, because they are current and they're they can be produced rapidly, more quickly than a painting, for instance, can serve as a commentary on everyday life. So they're very contemporary, and they're heterogeneous. The um, production of images for patrons, notably the church in the 17th century, or for aristocratic patrons, often involves the artist getting a brief that they have to fulfill. Artists working with printmakers and uh, publishers are often have much greater liberty to produce whatever they like. And it's often not particularly decorous or respectful. However, we can um, think of the printmaking as an art form that can achieve sublime effects. Um, I didn't realize I was actually going to be speaking in the same room as the wonderful James Barry prints. So these prints are among the largest prints produced in Britain in the 18th century. Um, and they were produced by an artist who was kicked out of the Royal Academy uh, for being a radical critic of Sir Joshua Reynolds. Um, and he also, according to William Blake, was reduced to living on bread and apples while painting the Royal Society murals, which, uh, if you don't know them, it's along with the Rubens paintings in uh, Whitehall, a, a claim to being London's Sistine Chapel. I think they're amazing paintings. But the prints are very interesting too, produced to keep him going, really, financially. But in the prints, he was able to be freer in the people that he included so it's a big painting of heaven, and he got to choose who was in heaven to a certain extent. So it's a sort of pantheon of Barry's uh, favorite people. And it's much more Catholic and Irish in the prints, much more radical than, than it would be in the paintings. So he's changing and constantly commenting uh, in the prints. And the Blake I'm showing you in terms of the, the idea of the sublime being reduced to a portable, smaller size. So this is 20 centimeters by 15 centimeters. Yet he's managed to get Leviathan, Behemoth, God and the Heavens, all into that small print. So scale is, is relative and it's possible to achieve sublime effects in printmaking. Or indeed strange, uh, monstrous things that you might not have imagined seeing in a painting. Um, the Goya etching is um, from his Los Caprichos series. Um, very original, almost qu quixotic uh, images um, that are exercises in cap caprice. So printmaking often associated with this idea of the capriccio, the, the spontaneous um, free exercise of invention, drawing on perhaps folklore or idiomatic sayings in the case of Goya. And with Blake, a very unusual print, this is a color print um, uh, where it's coming very close in scale and in its technique to painting. And drawing on all sorts of strange imagery um, is this Enetharmon, his own creation. It could be Hecate, the goddess of night, um, but it's hinting at sort of dark and sublime territory. 
Well, accelerating forward to the 1960s, um, I thought that these screen prints from the pop, British pop art uh, period illustrate the tendency of print to break the rules. So something like this wouldn't come in an edition. It would just be printed until the plate wore down, and then it might, the plate might be reworked, and you might have thousands and thousands of, of them. And sometimes prints have two dates, the date that the copper plate was engraved and the date that the particular impression that you have was taken off that copper plate. And they can be four or 500 years apart, in theory. Um, and so to counteract that and make prints more like proper art, limited editions were introduced. Completely arbitrary. Why produce just 40 or 100 instead of 1,000? It's to regulate. Um, and then also other rules, like the artist has to execute the print. Um, it's, it can't have anything attached to it. It must be in certain defined techniques. And so artists like Kitai and Tilson, who adopted um, the industrial method of screen printing, which um, is, is mainly, uh, well, de derives from basic poster, poster printing, they systematically went about breaking all the rules. Um, in the, the Kitai, for instance, we have a photograph of Picasso with a reproduction of the signature of Brack underneath it. It's obviously not Brack, it's Picasso, but um, the signature is also a copy. It's incorporated photographic materials, including um, a, a certificate for um, legalized prostitution in France, which is a quite satirical comment about the artists on, that are pictured on, on the print with, with the other elements that Kitai has brought together and juxtaposed. So prints do break the rules and they also interrogate media. So this is a Richard Hamilton screen print which draws on some of the last photographs of Marilyn Monroe, the last uh, photo session before her death. And Hamilton's interested here in interrogating photography as a medium by appropriating the images and incorporating them into screen print, but also incorporating Marilyn Monroe's own editing of the images. So the crosses are where she's saying, not this one. Though Hamilton is interested in the ambiguity of the cross because it could also mean a kiss as well. So it could be both um, self-harming marks and self-affirming marks. And then we get the approved one is given a, a pointing arrow and a tick by Marilyn Monroe. So there are two types of indexicality, if you like, here. There's the photographic image where um, the image is created by the light that's reflected off the actual uh, subject of the image. And then there's um, these marks that are made onto the negatives. Understanding Media is the title of a famous book by Marshall McLuhan, who famously said, the media is the message, the medium is the message, and Hamilton is operating in that sort of uh, terrain here in exploring the way in which uh, photography works through screen printing. Is, is the print hot or cold as a medium? These are the terms that Marshall McLuhan brought in. Television is hot, it gives you all the information you need. Radio is cold, it more, there's less information and engages your imagination more. There is a chapter on printmaking in McLuhan's uh, famous book. And we can find artists mixing media in a very experimental way um, as a result of uh, these developments in drawing on different, a wide array of different techniques. So this is a print, a recent print by Paul Caldwell, an artist I've worked with as a curator. And here Paul is um, using photography. 
He's using Photoshop to work on the photographic image. He's printed it using in inkjet, but then over the top of the inkjet, he has superimposed woodcut printing. So one of the oldest forms of wood uh, printmaking, the woodcut, which basically operates like a sort of sophisticated potato print. But those, those um, blocks have been cut by lasers. So there's a real mashup of different, some of the oldest and some of the newest techniques. And he's very interested in the, the surface interference that's created on, on the, the print. And prints have also, as a result of contemporary technology, moved into three dimensions now. So with 3D printers, you can have 3D prints. And this is a work by Marilyn Oliver. Um, I'm showing you it here in the gallery in Kent, uh, part of an exhibition that Marcel was, was part of too, um, The Female Nude Ways of Seeing. And this is a, a mobile, really. So it, it shows um, two figures hanging from the ceiling as a 3D print. Which brings me to uh, introducing Marcel's work, um, which in terms of technique is, uh, is quite uh, traditional. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Marcel. It's, it's etching and aquatint, and it's based on her extraordinary ability um, as a, a, in drawing. And it's the treatment of the subjects that's really astonishing. So this is... Uh, one that we acquired at Kent from Marcel's series, The Crying Game, uh, which looks at some of the terrible things that are happening um, in the contemporary world. So these are trafficked women. Uh, so rather like um, Goya, who I know you admire um, with his horrors of war, this is, this is a contemporary... Um, witness to, to terrible things. And then a wonderful series of more recent work which um, are a, a lovely form of reversal in that they're taking the Apocrypha from the Bible and focusing on some of the rebel women that we know from the biblical traditions, such as the Queen of Sheba, who we hear, see here um, revealing her hairy legs to King, um, King Solomon. Samson and Delilah, and um, Lilith, the queen of, of the night, Adam's first wife, according to certain traditions. So I'm going to end the PowerPoint there, and we're going to now have a conversation, Marcel. So, um, could you say something to begin with just about the technique that you use in, in your, your printmaking? Well, because I'm a painter, I, am, uh, I use a lot of layers in anything I do. Um, so, I do make a key drawing, I make, make a sketch and then sort of like to get a composition right, the sketches in pencil mostly, and then um, as I put a key drawing in a hard ground and I have a first proof, and I have no idea how or where it is going, except the key drawing, of course, has to be more or less right, although I can add and often add other aspects to the original drawing. And then I'm going to build up by either sort of adding aquatint, adding more drawing, putting another hard ground, putting scraping, messing around. So, you know, a lot of printmakers have quite a good idea how the image is going to look, so they're more efficient so that they do one or two bytes or one or two stages and then they got the print. Uh, a lot of my prints have maybe eight or nine stages before I think it actually works. Um, and so, you know, so they, they say, oh, you can't use that many aquatins. Well, you know, as long as you've got a plate, you, you just <laughs> have to get it to stick somehow. Uh, so, and I think, you know, you, you can build up a lot of tonal value, it becomes much richer. Then, for, for my taste, a, a flat kind of pristine 
uh, more calculated print. I mean, I admire it, but, you know, uh, it's not me. And you're both a painter and a, and a printmaker, so one of the things that sometimes um, happens is that we think of printmaking as subordinate to painting in, in practice, because prints often reproduce paintings, and also in terms of some notional hierarchy of the arts. Mm. How, how do you feel about that? Well, I agree. I think in my heart, I always think, oh, I'm a painter who also makes prints, but, you know, I am often, you know, or, or lately better known as a printmaker. And I think that now there's a cross kind of um, a fertilization between the two mediums. So things I do in printmaking, uh, technically, like a scraping, like in, I also do this in painting. So, and, and vice versa, I, have a, I make a painting and then I sort of do make a print of it, but they're not exactly the same. They might have just the same uh, subject matter. Um, but I think one of the key differences for me is that because printing, or etching at least, um, uses acid, you know, and I absolutely love acid. I mean, you know, I, I love all kind of acid, but also I really like nitric acid. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the fact that you have something that sort of nasty biting into metal, you know, I mean, you know, you can dissolve a human body in it if you use enough nitric. And I think that is something really exciting. So the kind of destructiveness of the material, so it bites into very hard material like, like metal, uh, sort of like brings out a kind of cruel, kind of funny, black kind of sense in me. You know, sort of my images in printmaking are kind of harsher, rawer, uh, sexier, but also sort of, yes, they're, they're just raw. I think that the material sort of makes that I have this giggly, witch-like attitude, which with painting I do not have in, in the same extent, to the same extent, yeah. Because at the moment you're revisiting some of the subjects from the Rebel Women series as paintings. Yeah. How is that, how's that working out? Well, I think, you know, that because I made a whole series, uh, 15 prints on the Rebel Women, and they're actually very rich subject matter in, uh, I don't mean in a religious sense, because I'm, that's not really my interest, but really because they, uh, they stand for, um, how to say, outwitting men. And I find sort of like, especially in these times, you know, where I think there's a lot of things about that, you know, the kind of mood about gender goes a bit in directions I personally, I'm not crazy about, and I think wit, you know, to outwit someone and make you know, people slightly looking with egg on their face, I think it's, it's a nice way to uh, release the tension, you know. So, and I, in painters as well, they have become, you know, that, uh, also that women, why should to be in their femininity always be nice and sweet or motherly or whatever? You know, we have all these aspects maybe to some extent, but also, you know, we can be... Yeah, you know, a bit manipulatively, a bit of vicious, a bit of like, you know, just, you know, a kind of bit of spice. And I feel that it is sort of very important to sort of like for the energy, which it sort of like, um, yeah, sort of it, it generates energy in me, just making them. Um, so I, I think I just want to sort of like activate that aspect in, instead of like the standard kind of presentation, both in painting and, and prints about what women should be, you know, in the whole, you know, doubt, you know, as sort of um, what, what your identity is if you don't have the characteristics which stick to boxes. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's a wonderful series. Um, and if you don't know it, the, this is the catalogue here. And you're often um, telling stories in which these resourceful women turn the tables on men. Yeah. And it's um, an interesting reading against the grain of the more uh, authorised biblical stories. Absolutely, yes, because you have sort of like a lot of Baroque paintings. And of course, there often the women are portrayed as the one, you know, the, the, the downfall uh, of men, like, like the Lot and his daughters, you know, although Lot was really the bad guy. Uh, you know, in paintings like Kranach and all that, you know, they are sort of the ones who are sort of the indecent ones, you know, the poor father was sort of made drunk, you know, to, in, to have incest with his daughter. So I feel also that, say, quite tongue-in-cheek, you know, I'm turning the tables on the standard kind of position, uh, 
you know, like Eve, you know, still is somewhere considered as the downfall of man. And I think, oh, come on, you know. So my Eve is actually, you know, climbing out of Adam with spiky high heels and net stockings, you know. <laughs> Adam has a bit of, oh my God, what is happening? So it's, 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 it's sharper, but it's also, I think, a little bit, you know, absurd. I think absurdity is, um, maybe especially in a European tradition of printmaking, uh, like Rob's, for instance, or even Goya, sort of like they use a lot of absurdity, uh, you know, to make a point. So it it is a it is a more playful kind of medium because it is faster. It is, uh, as I say, it has a bite to it in more ways than one. So prints also play a part in your practice in terms of inspiration. I know that having visited your studio, you have quite a few prints up in the studio. Um, yeah. Beckman, for instance, is a beautiful example yes. you have. Yes, I mean, you know, when I can, or if there's something I really fall for, um, I will buy prints. Um, I haven't got space anymore for paintings, and also, you know, that's a bit out of my range. But yeah, I, I really, I think when I started printmaking, which I relatively started quite late, um, then I actually discovered what a fantastic medium it is. And so, uh, yes, I have... You know, I still have a couple of artists I have my eye on, but, you know, um, because it's a bit like, you know, if I said nails of a saint, I mean, I like a particular artist, and then I have to find the right kind of work and to have in my surroundings. So, yeah. So is there something, do you think, then, about the printmaking medium that speaks to that side of your creativity, the humorous, biting... Uh, non-conformist side of your art is is that or or is it all sorts of arts that have inspired you in that respect or well as i say sort of like because my prints you know they they they, they sort of seem to activate a sort of like the, the medium a particular kind of side of me which I don't have in my daily life. I'm a bit of a mouse, you know. I don't really confront people at all, you know. Sort of like, but you know, in in, in my drawing, I, I can. I'm, I'm totally shameless, and I find that sort of it's quite nice. So you have an alter ego, and and they, um, and it's sort of like so. You know, of course, you know, I don't want to be all the spirit people. I can just draw them, and by drawing them. I sort of get that energy of being like that, you know, but, you know, I wouldn't sort of like, you know, I don't even know how to, you know, I'm afraid of big knives, for instance, you know, <laughs> somebody gave me one of those Japanese cooking knives and don't dare to use it because I think, no, this is, <laughs> will go totally wrong in my hands, you know, so, um, so I think what, what it is with prints also traditionally is that they have a rebellious kind of aspect. It is sort of like getting people, you know, like if you look at Chinese, for instance, uh, woodcuts, you know, prints, and, you know, or in Mexico where they pasted prints on the walls to start revolutions. It's a very direct way to get people, uh, you know, to transfer an ID, to give people an ID, uh, to, to, to arouse people. There's a lot of energy in prints. It's very different than painting. And, um, you know, it's not less or more, it is just different. And I find that quite exciting. It is, it, it, I think it satisfied my side of stirring up a little bit of trouble, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and still, I'm slightly removed of it. I say, yep, yeah, you know, it's just out there. <laughs> Don't kill the messenger kind of thing. So, yeah. <laughs> so some, some artists, um, I guess Kitai, who we talked about earlier, is one where the, the printmaking is is less serious than the, the painting for, mm. for them as an artist. But then it becomes more free in a way because there's less invested in it. it it's, I mean, for me, I, I quite like his prints more than I like his paintings. Mm, um, too, yeah. So there, there's a sense in which they're, um, they're not as over-determined as the paintings. Mm. But I think, you know, sort of aside saying that, you know, things are absurd and, and all that rawness, but also say like in the crying game, I said my work has always kind of so seriousness underneath as well. So you can, but I think, you know, like say subject matter which is just in the crying game, which is quite heavy. You know, I so don't think it would work in painting because it would have say kind of moral kind of like weight, which would be cause, you know, you don't want to sort of lift it with that. And I think with a print, um, you can also do things which are, you know, serious in subject matter, but 
partly because of the size, partly because of black and white, it has a, a different touch also for the viewer. So you have, a, a, in a way, a greater loose freedom, uh, both for the viewer and the maker, um, in printmaking than in, in painting. You know, sort of because I'd say um, I don't really particularly like to paint genitalia. I mean, I really, you know, it's, you know, but I, I don't. But you know, you can draw them in a quite, you know, nice and fast way. It's just, it's just different. You know, you make just a line. But you know, sort of like I've seen paintings with big genitalia, and God, you know, you know, can you, can you know, it's, it's not interesting. You know, so yeah, you know, it's, it's different. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Marcel. Shall we open it up to questions or? Okay. Um, I've got a couple of questions um, regarding the techniques that you use when you make your etchings. Yeah. So um, you use copper plate and nitric zinc. acid, zinc and nitric Mostly. acid. Um, do you? T you I'm assuming from looking at your work that you don't like time your aquatints and just use one aquatint and like measure that the tonality like that. It seems no. to me that you work much more intuitively and yeah. put, and you mentioned that you scrape things back mm. and burnish and then mm. reapply. Yeah, all that. For instance, you know, all the hair, you know, it's, it has a hard ground bite, but all the white bits are just scraped so away. Using a, right. Yeah. Um, something you mentioned about the difference between painting and etching, and I think the point that you were talking about, about your techniques, highlights this element of risk in the making of the etching plate. And there's, a, there's so much gamble in the process of making the plate. I was wondering, because you have to take such risks in your etching, does that um, strengthen you or make you more bold in your painting? No, I think the risk factor in, in printmaking and or in etching and painting is the same. Uh, the only difference is really the body language. You know, with painting a stand, and I do it in, mostly in the light, in the daytime. I don't work with electric light. Uh, with etching, I sit down and sort of like, uh, and, and they are often, the, the, the images are conceived mostly in the night. Um, so they have a different, you know, but really no, in the, in, in the risk taking of making the image, um, no, they're both t t demand the same. Yeah, demand the same. There's no, no difference in that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, I was really interested, I am really interested in um, how you came to start printing. Um, so was it in a, in a studio? Was it in a, an academy or a school setting? Was it on your own? kind of finding your way. I wondered, when did you first encounter printmaking yourself? You know, printmaking is sort of like technically, it's hardly more than science. You know, it's not really that difficult. You just have to do it a couple of thousands times to get a feel for it. But it's not really, you know, a painting is much more difficult. Uh, but I had sort of like, I knew someone who had booked a course of printmaking or etching really at Morley College with Frank Colony. Um, she couldn't uh, go to the course because she had to let, leave London. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of freebies. And she gave me the course. She said, oh, do you want it? And I said, yeah, yeah, anything free, I will do it. And so I found it, I, I did it, and I found it incredibly frustrating and very irritating kind of medium. And, you know, I have two tendencies. Well, I think like all of us, you either get frustrated and irritated and you walk out, or you become so determined not to be sort of like, you know, beaten by something stupid like a, you know, technique. That, you know, I just persevered. And so it was really, um, so I did the course, I think, for six months or something, nine months maybe. And then um, I did a three months B-Tech and then I went straight to the studio where I work now, which is a collective studio, and just messed around till it worked. So... Yeah, so I'm more or less self-taught, and I really don't know anything about how to set the presses, how to mix acids. So I have very limited knowledge on toast techniques, but you know, so sort of the, in the meantime, I've learned, you know, kind of a sensitivity intuitively to the medium. So that is, you know, really the rest is you know, somebody else can do really. You know. so yeah. We've got um, a question online. 
but questions in the room, we will come back to you. Um, so one of the questions online is asking, how does the place where prints can be seen matter to the message of the print? Uh, I think that's for either yeah. of you. It's quite interesting. I, I really like, you know, sort of like over the last few years that prints are seen in public collections uh, because people, uh, you know, if you have, say, a commercial kind of setting like a gallery or, or, or an art fair, people look at prints really, or at the work per se, whether they can live with it, you know, whether they can afford it, of course, but also whether they can live with it. And I've had a lot of times, I still hear this, people say, oh, you know, I absolutely love the work, but I can't live with that, you know, so I think, yeah, you know. So, um, you know, I think it's a little bit of a weak excuse, but still, that is what I hear a lot. But in public spaces, of course, people feel not threatened by having to take that position if they can have it in their room and what will the neighbors say. And so there is a, a much uh, kind of openness for people who would never have these kind of things in their surroundings, maybe these kind of images, that they can uh, really, really look at it and uh, get it impinged in them. I did sort of like a, a show in the Fitzwilliam Museum uh, in the beginning, yeah, beginning of the year, as I did in Antwerp, in, 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 a, in a graphic museum there. And there were ladies who sort of like were in the beginning really shocked by the work and they said, oh no, I can't look at that. And then later on, they came back to me, the how much, you know, when they looked at it again, how much it sort of like really started to sort of work for them. So, and I, so I think so public space has sort of like, uh, people feel uh, less threatened by, you know, the decision whether they can live with it and whether, you know, in their personal space, you know. So I, I really like public spaces for that, yeah. Well, or somebody's house, of course, and I think that's very great, but yeah. It, it would be nice to see more prints in, on display publicly. Yeah. Um, so if you think about national collections, thousands and thousands of prints compared to how many paintings there are. And I mean, arguably the Tate's collection of works on paper is more interesting than the collection of paintings. And yet we rarely see prints on display um, so that would be nice to see its prints uh, more regularly shown. Um, also, they're probably less daunting uh, in whether it's in a workspace or in your own home or in a public space because they don't have that sort of enormous price tag on them. So there isn't that feeling that, you know, you can't spill the coffee near the Leonardo Salvatore Mundi type of thing. Um, <laughs> But, but yes, living with, with a print in your own home is, is a really lovely experience because you do get to know it, uh, different moods, different weather conditions, uh, different times of day, and, and it changes and it grows um, as you get to know it. And that's an experience that would be great to have with more valuable artworks, but I think for most people the print is the art form where you can afford to buy a really good print. It would be sort of like um, a hobby like following a football team or being interested in a sport uh, like uh, angling or something. It'd be a similar sort of investment of time. And Collecting trainers. Or what? Or, yeah, so <laughs> w whatever it is. Um, so I think it is a form of art collecting that is within reach of of people, say, on an average salary. Um, and it, it is very rewarding to live with, a, with an artwork. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to come back to that thing that Ben, you were saying about the, um, the reversal in printmaking, because that was such a compelling idea. I just wanted to ask Marcel whether that was something that you found to be, like, an important part of your work or how do you deal with reversal in your printmaking especially as you mentioned that you often do prints um, of your painting sometimes and how that interacts with that kind of process so yes but I don't do prints of my paints I will use the same subject matter and then mm. think you know do it in print they, they're not a print of my painting it makes actually it, to, to me it's totally irrelevant that they are you know a mirror image because 
Well, yeah, totally irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> because Love you know, it. sort Great. of like my, my images have nothing to do with an outer reality. So mm -hmm. you know, think also what what you talked about. So these were sort of seventeenth century prints were made, say, of a painting or of a sculpture, and so they they were say a cheaper version, like say photocopy. Nowadays, you can have mm -hmm. a photocopy of any kind of painting in your room, uh, you know. But that was then the photocopy kind of way. So it was maybe more, you know, more of an issue whether it would that it was reversed. But you know, my work is is all, you know, in inner world. So really, you know, which way it comes out, it makes absolutely a difference to me. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. I mean, you do get people copying prints that then reverse the reversal of the orientation, yes. and it goes back and forth. Yeah. It it only becomes a big issue with left-handed gestures. So you can't have Christ blessing with the left hand. Um, but sometimes things like Adam accepting the the apple from Eve, the various games around that where it's it's soft and deliberate. It's clear from the where we have the original drawing that Eve is meant to be seen using her left hand. It's not just the so the, the sinister hand, as it were. But yes, apart from that, there seems to be this huge um, acceptance of reverse reversal in images. We've just got um, two online questions there for you, Marcella, so I'm going to kind of put them together. Um, so someone was saying that you mentioned that you don't work with electric light, and that prompted them to question if you go to bed when it gets dark and get up when it gets light. No, no, I don't paint with electric light. Ah, there we because go. Because I can't see, you know, if you paint in daytime, the, the, all the colours look different in the evening. So no, of course mm. I work. <laughs> 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 and I'm a night person, definitely, yeah. And then there was another comment saying that your prints derive their visceral power from their not being too clean, and they're wondering if you could speak to that. Right. But not too clean a subject matter or in execution? I think they're saying in execution, but you could speak yeah. to both. Well, no, you sort of not too clean a subject matter, of course, that is half the fun, but... Um, not to clean execution, you know, I do file the sides of my plates, you know, so like, you know, there's some things which I think need to be neat. Um, I was like Nolder, sort of like, who's a wonderful printmaker, German printmaker, but he's rubbish, you know, his plates look like, you know, the sort of ratty kind of sides and sort of really, you know, he's, he's terrible, you know. So I find some things need to be pristine, well, more or less pristine, and others is a matter. So, yeah, all, I don't have a pristine whites on my plate because I use so many layers, so the whites always have a lot of, little bit of foul biting, which I find, you know, sort of adds, for me, I think it's really, that's, you know, how I like it to be, really. Um, but also, basically, I'm not good in keeping anything pristine, so, you know, I'm just... <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, two things. Um, first of all, Marcel, do you have different uh, reactions in different countries to your subjects? And then I was also wondering um, if the Tate and other museums don't show that many prints, why would that be? So how, how is the reception and is it different in different countries maybe as well? Uh, I, I think there is a sense that if people are going to come to a museum, they need to see something special and very high quality, and that perhaps there's a lingering prejudice against against prints as multiples, and also because they tend not to be coloured. So black and white images tend to be uh, seen as less interesting. Um, Connoisseurship of prints can be also quite an off-putting thing. It's um, always very tempting to start explaining things like states and foul bite and this baffling um, vocabulary that comes with printmaking. And yes, to be honest, some of the literature on prints is not the most inviting literature in, in the whole history of art. So the writing about painting is is often of a higher quality and so all of these things I think lead to prints being in my opinion undervalued as artworks um, 
I think it's mainly the multiple thing, but there are these other other factors too. Um, the so, British Museum is the only one who shows prints continuously. Yes. Uh, I mean, they have brilliant. I mean, they have a print room where you know prints are. All. I mean, uh, just to encourage people to go to print rooms. I mean, mm. you you can email the British Museum. The VNA has a great print room. Um, Tate has a wonderful print room. I I spent. I think three very happy hours looking at William Blake drawings just after Christmas, and I had the place to myself. So it, it does involve a little bit of planning, but there is no better way, really, of looking at art than being in a print room on your own and then bringing you a big box of things to go through. It's a bit like Christmas if you love art. And um, it's not like shuffling around a blockbuster exhibition where... Um, with the best one in the world, that's not the best conditions in which to to look at art. Um. Just actually also two things, uh, one observation and one question for Marcel. Um, but the quick observation is um, speaking of places, public collections that don't seem to be showing prints all that often, the new renovation of the National Portrait Gallery has actually been incorporating prints in dialogue with their paintings, uh, which they never used to do before. But also they've got this one room dedicated to printmaking where they also have like a video and like plates showing how to make aquatint and mesotint. Um, and I thought that was just a really amazing sort of starting point for this kind of, um, I suppose, a revolution to showing more prints uh, and making people more aware of it. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on that basically. Um, but for Marcel, um, you mentioned sort of drawing quite a lot um, in your process and you know, we all know you from your etchings and accident, and I've always seen etching as a draftsman's kind of medium. And I was wondering whether you had also been interested in other types of techniques, like, say, for example, lithograph, which is also quite drawing-based as well. I have done a little bit of lithograph, uh, lithography, but, uh, you know, there's two kind of big no-nos about it for me. First of all, those stones are a real pain. You know, they really are, you know, they're heavy and they're sort of cumbersome and you can't sort of take them with you and sort of work, you know, with, you know, you have to, and they sort of stay flat so you cannot sort of put them upright or at different angles. Well, not easily at least. But uh, secondly, what I dislike is that you have to print the whole edition of it, um, you know, which mostly you sort of print your edition while with etching or, you know, have an edition of 30 but I only print two or three and then, you know, I can a year later print another three, you know, and, and they'll, they'll be exactly the same. But most of all, I find with lithography, it's not as free to work in layers as in an etching plate. An etching plate, you can really, you know, if you slightly stick within some kind of basic principles of what, then you can really do whatever you like, add layers and scrape, take them off and add, and, you know, really make a tonal value from 0 0.0 till 100. You cannot do in lithography. I find, you know, um, the kind of like, t the, the grey tones are much li more limited in lithography than in etching. And say the whole sensuality, which you also get in painting, you have this everlasting tone of values, which I find really exciting. Uh, you do not get in lithography. So yes, the line is beautiful. But yeah, for me then practical came down, the stones, the weight of the stones, and the fact that I had to print an edition. I've done a few lit lithographs, they're okay. But, you know, I think I would need another 10 years, really, to be good at it. And I haven't got another 10 years. Yeah, no, no, you know, because, you know, I want to add some paint and, you know, I will be sort of in a Zimmer frame, you know, within 10 years. No, you know, you have to be realistic about things. So to be that good, you know, 10 years minimum, so I thought, oh, well, next life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, um, to come back to this question of prints being on display and ideally more prints on display, only because it hasn't been mentioned already, um, prints are light sensitive and can't be on permanent display in, in galleries and in museums, unlike paintings and unlike other media. Um, so I'm really, I'm really glad that you've both already invoked study rooms and, and how critical they are um, to, to the study and access um, to prints. Um, but following up on Nigel's point, um, I think the challenge um, when we're talking about the sort of, yeah, the display and access to prints in, in gallery and museum spaces is um, this, 
they require particular lighting conditions that um, are, might be different from other media. So if they're mixed media, of course, you know, I'm, you are well aware of these constraints to works on paper. Um, but I think the general public is often not aware of, of these sort of um, challenges to displaying works on paper. Um, I'm, I'm heartened that um, recent um, rehangs and, and reinstallations sort of um, take up that challenge, and it has been done brilliantly in, in some exhibitions. Um, but that is, that is a sort of um, challenge and sort of I don't want to say limitation, but consideration to um, to displaying works on paper, um, and some you know because earlier in in your talk, Ben, you mentioned popular prints and kind of satirical prints, and sometimes the sort of the curation of prints. There's something so wonderfully ironic about putting a brilliant mount on something that would have been kind of crumpled up and pasted on, um, you know, a, a signpost or something like this. So I think the kind of the museum aspect of prints is the sort of yet another dimension to what's been sort of um, discussed here. Um, but um, yeah, ju just to say the sort of the, the light sensitive um, aspect to it. And I think what's fascinating about the way prints are displayed in, in museums and galleries is that technique is always part of it. And that's not true for other media. It's, it's almost as if you can't really display a print without discussing, is it an etching, is it a lithograph, and so forth. And what does that mean for how the image was constructed or how the image was made? Can I just say something? Because personally, I find that I, I like that sort of vision print image that you see the technique, you know, what it is made for. But you know, I think people are much too sort of hung up about technical aspect of printmaking. You know, I mean, painting has a lot of technical aspect, but nobody talks about that. And I find, you know, people sort of say, oh, the technical aspect is a technical aspect. You know, just look at the image. The end result is really what it is about. And if I sort of meet a colleague and they say, oh, how did you get that black? And I say, oh, do this. And they say, oh, you know, you have shop talk. But otherwise, I find you know the too much technical waffle really takes away from the impact of the image. It is about the image. The end result, you should not see the technique. You should not see how difficult or how clever it was to get that result. And I'm, now I'm really serious and passionate about not to sort of stick on the cleverness and the skill, because that should not be visible. What should be apparent is what happens to you when you see it. You know, when you see an attractive man or woman, you're not going to think about the creational process of a div divinity, are you? You're just sort of, mm. yeah. <laughs> That is all what it is about. And I think with Sprint Megan, it's a bit too much hammering on about, say, the technical process. Uh, you know, so sorry. Uh, it's just, it's a, I have a bit of a bee about that. Yeah, <laughs> Obviously, clearly. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yes, I, I agree with that too. And um, it, it, is, it is a constraint. And of course, you're absolutely right about the, con the light sensitive nature. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't be constantly changing displays within the, within the constraints. So it's, um, and, and also what we have is, is a, a result of collecting and so yeah. if you think of the millions and millions of printed images that must have existed I, I forget which book it is but um, there, there is a one of the standard books about print history which says uh, we've all seen a Rembrandt etching but who's ever seen a Victorian matchbox and so the Victorian matchbox must have been one of the most common printed images and they've all been thrown away um, I think Peter Blake maybe saw one because he tried to recreate one in, in one of his, his artworks. But the huge amount of ephemera that is gone, and, and also the, I mean, something I didn't really stress perhaps enough was the, the beautifully international quality of, of the print market. So I, I was once invited to participate at the edges of a research project called the British Printed Image. And one of the things that I was slightly worried about there was that if you went into a print shop on the Strand in the 18th century, 
or the 17th century, even more so, most of the images would have been Flemish or Dutch, and then they would have been French, and then they would have been Italian, and then a very small proportion of them would have been made by British printmakers. So what, what do we have? Is it representative what we have? Probably not. I mean, we, how rich things must have been, but how much of lesser quality has survived? I mean, these, these judgments of quality are partly the result of judgments that our ancestors have made about what's worth preserving and what isn't. And occasionally you get these wonderful chance discoveries of, of uh, I mean, there's the famous one of the, the ship caught in the ice, which has got lots of, there were lots of prints there that showed how much more diverse and rich the image repertoire was at, at the time. But I'm heartened to hear that things are changing. I haven't been to the Nas National Portrait Gallery yet, no, but thank you, Nigel. I'll have a look, yeah. This is fantastic, I have to say. And I, I said to, as, as you all came in, and I mean this in a very positive way, I was so pleased to see so many faces of people I didn't know. Because sometimes, and I've been here a while, <laughs> you know, you go, oh, it's the usual suspect, or so-and-so, you know, they always come to everything. But actually, it's very nice to have, to feel that people are here because they're responding to a particular, you know, subject and a presentation. And I think it's very lively. And, you know, it's, it's so difficult, isn't it, to be cut and dry with prints versus painting and all these different things are thrown in. Uh, and my own area of interest is particularly the 18th century. And it's even there, it's kind of, you know, there are all sorts of, you know, different ways of thinking about it. The, the, the reproductive printmakers, metzitant makers, fantastically skilled individuals who spent months and months and months. I'm thinking of people like William Pether who reproduced Wright of Derby's paintings. They are in every sense as remarkable as the oils on which they are based. And the skill factor is just off the scale. You have to be trained to do this and the drudgery and the pain and it being off your rocker and all that sort of thing. But then said against that, you've got people who are equally skilled um, at printmaking who are incredibly inventive. And two of my favorite um, printmakers are William Blake and Thomas Buick. And Buick's an extraordinary man, extraordinary philosopher, extraordinary artist. You know, he's not a member of the, you know, who doesn't really have any time for the Royal Academy and produces these tiny little wood engravings on blocks, which are exquisite. And the, but the imagery is also, and the thought process and his engagement with the natural world is exquisite. And you'd think, you know, Blake and, and, and Buick are in one sense quite different because Blake's art is coming principally through his, filtered through his imagination, whereas Buick's is very much filtered through the exterior world, but um, I would never think of them, oh, printmakers versus paint, you know, painters. They are artists, and I think that's the thing, is that printmakers are, I think of them first and foremost as people who make art. Uh, Hogarth, another great he hero of mine, you know, who is a great painter, a great colorist, often underestimate how fantastic he is as a painter, but of course he starts as an engraver, because basically he he can't afford a painting trainer. He's, 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 uh, people always say he, uh, he was apprenticed to a very ordinary engraver. Well, he wasn't. He was apprenticed to a great, still a great engraver. Um, uh, you know, he, he worked with people who engraved on plate, and that in itself was a great skill. Plate, because we haven't, we talked about paper, we've talked about paint, but you know, uh, making images on metallic surfaces, uh, you know, because the, the, that's all kind of bound up together. The other amazing thing about William Hogarth is, of course, he invented. The, those narratives were his invention, and, and that's the extraordinary thing. You know, everything came out of here, the, the great narrative series. But at the same time, he realized that there were individuals who could probably do certain things better than he was. And when he was doing Marriage à la Mode, he went to France. He tucked one of the pictures under his arm, and he went to Paris. And he went there because he needed to find guys who could do it. And the French were really good at it. And so he went and found French engravers because he just knew that they had a skill base that he simply couldn't find here. And so I think it's that, that's, 
what I'm banging on about is, is, this, is, is to me, it's a kind of homogenous. I don't, uh, you know, because um, when we were thinking about this very series, we finished the series last autumn and uh, having conversation with a few colleagues and, and somebody, it was actually Esther Chadwick at the Courtel principally, she said, well, why don't we do something on printmaking? You know, and at first I was thinking, oh, yes, you know, painting in the middle, printmaking on the side, <laughs> let's do something marginal. Well, I, you know, I got my wrist slapped for that because it's not marginal. It's not a marginal activity. But as you say, going back to the print room thing, it's marginalised because, you know, um, there's not that access. You know, the, the, the BM, just across the road, that print room does exist. You can book in, you can get a box of... Uh, works on paper out and you can spend a, I tell my son this, he's in his 20s now he's doing sculpture and I said look mate, you can go in there and you've got just as much a right to be in there as anybody who is an expert you know, because it can get a bit of feet there's no doubt about it about proofs and states and who knows what and, and then the value thing comes in uh, and so, you know um, and, and lots of Regional museums have print, print rooms. They have great print collections. I was at Colchester recently. They're stacked up to the ceiling with this stuff, and they can't even, you know. But cataloging them, even even knowing what they've got, is a problem because there's not the investment in knowing what what they have. Gosh, I've gone on a bit there. <laughs> um, but that was really good. I really enjoyed that. It was so 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 multifaceted. And thank you both so much for, you know, giving. Uh, giving your um, thoughts and, and sharing your knowledge and expertise, and also to everybody else, uh, and what you've brought to it. Uh, this, is, this has been a, a lovely evening. Um, and, hey, it's 25 past seven, so I think at that point, I, I may, I'd just like to formally thank our speakers again, and, uh, and then we can go... And...